And I just want to start by briefly introducing um, the Community Engagement Forum and uh, these coffee and chat um, sessions. Um, so the Community Engagement Forum, um, we're part of the CCCM cluster, where we're an interagency and intersectoral um, community of practice on um, engaging populations in displacement responses. So we're here to share um, challenges and experiences and ideas and resources and tools and best practices on anything around um, how to engage um, people in displacement responses. Um, these coffee and chat sessions, they're one of the platforms where we do this. And um, the topics are decided based on the requests from the, from all of you, from the forum participants and forum members. And uh, today's topic, um, it's been in the works for a long time. We've been wanting to talk about um, how to engage the displaced population in Gaza for months. Um, but um, as we were chatting about at the start now, um, it's been quite difficult to find um, people who have good examples of not from the lack of trying to engage the population, but from actually being able to um, to reach them and, um, and to communicate um, to be able to facilitate participation um, among displaced um, and uh, to get their feedback on the services because of I mean, all the challenges that we will discuss today. Um, so with that, I'll introduce um, our contributors today. Um, so we have Iman Mukbal, who is the um, NRC Site Management Project Coordinator based in Gaza. Um, and Joanna Rich, she is the NRC Site Management Project Manager. She's based in Jerusalem. Um, it's correct, right, Joanna? You're in Jerusalem? No, I'm actually in Amman. So I'm in, Amman, be in sorry. Gaza, but whilst we can't be in Gaza, we're in Amman at the moment. Okay, thank you um, and welcome. Um, and also, please correct me if I mispronounce your names. Um, we have uh, Gil Francis uh, Aravalo. He was waving to us earlier there. If you can turn on your camera, Gil, and say hello. Um, he has uh, um, been part of the NORCAP standby expert roster supporting community engagement and AAP uh, since 2021. And he's currently supporting the UN Women in the, the OPT as Complaints and Feedback Mechanism Manager and AAP Focal Point um, under the NORCAP uh, um, Partnership Agreement. Um, and uh, finally, we have also Yusuf Hamash. Again, please let me know if I'm mispronouncing uh, uh, your names. Um, he's a Palestinian filmmaker and a former NRC advocacy coordinator in Gaza. Um, some of you might have seen him um, sharing um, communicating from Gaza um, um, during the last 11 months. Um, um, I've seen him via Instagram myself. Um, so um, welcome to to everyone. Um, um, and you'll all have um, you'll all have a chance to to ask them questions um, about their programming and about what they're able to do um, in Gaza. Um, and uh, I I want to start with a question myself, <laughs> and then you'll all have the chance. Um, and uh, I want to start um, with uh, Joanna and Iman, if that's okay, um, and ask if you can share um, examples um, of how you've been able to um, uh, to you know engage the displaced community in Gaza, um, um, because you gave me um, some really good examples that um, I felt um, was actually handing over a bit of the decision around how to how to frame the response. And I want to, you to share it with the rest of them here, if that's okay. 
Oh, so maybe I'll start. Um, so yeah, currently in, in NRC, we've got a site management strategy, which is based around the establishment of community-based governance structures in informal settlements. Um, and if it's okay, Kristen, I'll give a little bit of, I mean, I, I'll give a bit of context if that's all right. Um, Please, yeah. So we, when we were looking at our site management strategy in Gaza, you know, we had, of course, we all want to be having this community-based programming, but actually that wasn't the, the focus of, of our work at the time. Mostly we were just looking at how can we try and get services into, into sites? How can we get this population to be able to get humanitarian services as a site management agency? How can we most effectively support the coordination of those services? Um, and we found that um, there was a, quite a variation of, of sites. So um, I have a, Kristen, is it okay if I just keep going and, and give this bits of information? Please. Yes, please, it's very useful. So I thought it would be nice to start with like giving you a bit of an idea about the site landscape, uh, just to give a context of how we've come to this and, and why we think it, it works well and why we think it's important. So. Um, there's currently around 2,500 um, IDP sites in Gaza at the moment. That that number of sites is hosting around a million people. So it's about 200,000 households. Um, the, the sites that we see are split between a few different categories. Um, and you can see there's a there's some UNRWA schools which are hosting a hosting IDPs. There's um, they represent about eight percent of the site. So there's probably so that's about eighty thousand people in those. There are schools which are managed by Ministry of Education, which is about twelve percent. But then the vast majority of people, which is like um, eight hundred thousand people, living in these makeshift sites. And this when we talk about makeshift sites, it's like a mixture of tents. Um, tarpaulins where they've been able to be got into Gaza and then just materials people have been able to source themselves uh, to, to put together to be able to sleep in. Um, when we were going to these sites to understand a little bit about how they were working we found quite drastic differences in the way that services were being provided for the population depending on the type of management that was in place in the sites. So in UNRWA schools, for example, UNRWA is obviously managing those. In the non-UNRWA schools, it, they are managed by Ministry of Social Edu Ministry of De Education. And then in the makeshift sites, we saw quite a difference in the provision of services depending on, on how the site had developed. So we found some sites where a community focal point had kind of stood up, had the capacity to engage with the humanitarian community, had been able to put together, for example, registration lists, had the confidence and the capacity to interact with the humanitarian community. And therefore, the, those populations that were in those sites were getting, were getting at least basic services. Um, there's obviously like huge limits to the amount of humanitarian service provision in Gaza at the moment. And so um, where you know, there's limits in all agencies. And so where agencies approach sites or go to sites and there is someone there to be able to facilitate that access, then they can provide the service. But if they go to a site and they find nobody there, then it's it's very difficult for them to operate because most agencies don't have the kind of staffing to be able to do things like go and do registrations or, mm -hmm. you know, household level assessment to put together these things. So we had this idea that, so we, we saw this and we saw it very practically. We, we would go to sites and we would see on one side of the road where there was a site with a community focal point, you would find that there were toilets, there were the population was getting food, um, you know, there was distributions ongoing, there was water being provided. And then we'd look across the road at another site where there wasn't this community focal point and we'd find basically nothing. Like the site had had no toilets, had no food, like the population was literally not having food, not having water. And so we were trying to, you know, that was, those were the sites, those sites that really had nothing that we thought we wanted to focus on. And I was looking in preparation for this to see like, what are the numbers? Cause we know they exist cause we see them and we know there's many of them, 
but according to the assessments that have been carried out, actually it's like 22% of sites are reporting that they have no management at all. So that's like something like 500 sites in that situation. Um, so given that scale, as a site management agency, we thought considering especially that there are so few site management agencies in Gaza right now, we just thought that it would be, it's just impossible to think that, uh, that we could go and provide CCCM services in 500 sites when we have a very small team and all the challenges that exist. So we came up with this idea that we would like to instead try and at least get those sites up to the point of the other sites with the community focal point. So we looked at a way we've developed a, a strategy where we will go into sites and we will try and establish a site management committee um, by engaging the population, doing a, a rapid election process and then supporting them to assign roles and responsibilities and providing some capacity building that will allow them to be able to be in the position to then advocate for the needs in their sites with the humanitarian agencies and be that conduit, be the be the um, agency that, you know, be the uh, committee that the agency can approach, that can get registration lists, that can support with organising distributions, that can store goods. Um, so we're, so we've, we've come up with this strategy and we were quite excited about it, but obviously a little nervous, like, are we going to be able to just go into sites and start establishing committee when they don't know us and we're just you know, walking in there? Um, Iman's going to tell you a bit about how we've done it practically, but um, we've started piloting this in the past couple of months and we've honestly seen really great results. Like we we have engaged the, com the communities, we've been able to establish these committees. The committees have have had the confidence to start feeling like they can make a change in, in the sites. Um, so in our strategy, we, we want to try and spread this now as far as possible. So our plan is that we will you know, go into a site, establish a committee, do some capacity building, uh, provide them with some funding for a community-led project, mostly focused on um, care and maintenance at the moment, or basic site infrastructure, and and then we'll and then we'll move on to the next site. We'll still provide some kind of uh, remote support, but not intensive because we want to just try and cover as many sites as possible that are in this very desperate situation of just having nothing at all. Um, so yeah, that's my little brief introduction. I'm like, obviously, like we we're quite excited about this, and we're quite proud of what we've done so far. So we're really happy to share it and happy to answer questions. But I'd love if I could hand over to Iman and and she could tell yeah. us about how it's been on the ground. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah. yeah. Joanna, man, um, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, thank. You. Yeah, thank you, Zwana. Uh, I think it's like an introduction to cover a lot of, um, yeah, the old things, but maybe we can um, highlight uh, some of our uh, work on the ground. Um, as Zwana mentioned, we are like targeted till now, targeted for sites in Dir al-Balah, which is the middle area of Gaza to establish site management committee there, uh, which is like um, this forming those committees, which is, um, um, uh, yeah, which will, which um, happened by uh, consult the community itself to also the, the committee forms, it's related to the need for those sites. So there is, um, for each site, there is many committees there or like each site has its own committees or own uh, responsible uh, person or representatives inside each site. So we uh, um, we conduct the same process in each site, but the, each site has its own uh, structure uh, for uh, its committee. Uh, we start like um, to select the sites. Uh, the site selection was um, we conduct like assessment. It's like um, a unified tool used by site management working group. So we are assess the sites we are visited by our uh, numerators, and uh, then we uh, choose the sites which uh, has a lack of management or representatives, and or some of them or some of sites has no management there. 
and uh, so we explain for them our goal our uh, uh, objective for setting up those committees and what's the um, the benefits will the sites have after after um, develop those committees i think most of them like um, accept our intervention because there is a big need and urgent need on all sites because those sites suffering from many things they are um, like they um, has like a shortage if for everything like uh, basic needs from water, uh, bedding, uh, everything like food, everything it's like um, uh, there is a shortage there. So um, they uh, accept us as we are like has many intervention and we also like connect them with others, with other uh, uh, humanitarian actors. So um, we uh, gave those community the information for uh, how to uh, establish this committee, how to do this, how to consult people or IDBs themselves uh, about their representatives so we can um, we can establish this committee according to their needs. So uh, it's the, like uh, uh, giving them the information for this issue and uh, they accept us. So we uh, after that we conduct a meeting like to um, to choose their representatives by like a small meetings which uh, contain like the the representative the community representatives or uh, the the community leaders and some of the families so they can choose their representatives to formulate those committees uh, so uh, by uh, co conducting like those meeting and uh, um, they like um, uh, explain for them uh, exactly what's our objective and what's the rules and responsibilities for each person or each one or each representative. So they raise their hand to vote for the nominated persons and then we f we create like the structure with consulting with the people or with the IDBs themselves. And now we are we are forming those uh, committee in four sites in uh, in Gaza, and now we are preparing for uh, capacity building material to support this committee in many uh, issues related to the uh, registration, to referrals, to how to network with other humanitarian actors. So uh, the next step, inshallah, will be to uh, conduct a training or capacity building for this those uh, committees. Uh, for sure, there is um, a lot of a challenging facing us as a staff and facing also the committee inside those sites to uh, manage or to do their works. Um, for, from our sides, like um, uh, the, the situation in Gaza is not stable, as you know, I think from the news and from uh, um, many issues that there is like um, a continuous movement. Uh, from side to side, from block to block. So we are maybe sometimes we start working in sites like uh, what's happened before. We start on, that's on the south of Gaza, Rafah uh, governorate to, to work our site management activities. Then there is many evacuation orders from this area. And now there is, uh, it was full of IDB sites, but now there is no site there. Now they are all of them uh, moved to, uh, to uh, next to the sea or uh, to the west of, uh, of Gaza and to the middle area. So we transfer our work to the middle area. So when we start working with the site, sometimes we can't complete because of the evacuation orders, because of the continuous movement. So it uh, restricts uh, our uh, intervention in, uh, in many sites. Also, there is a lot, the number of uh, IDBs very large. Yeah, if we, we speak about IDBs there in Gaza, uh, more than 1 million, I think. It's, well, it's very, uh, there is a very crowdness in the area. So there is a lot of IDBs and there is no spaces for those persons because there is a lot of uh, threatened blocks and people uh, try to move from the threatened places to other um also there is like um yani uh, uh the the committee themselves uh they have a, a lack of capacity so we will uh, do our best to give them like a a, a capacity or capacity building to uh, deal with those idbs and with the other humanitarian actors so they can um coordinate with them um 
Yeah, this is from our side. Uh, Thank and you. if you and has anything, Joanna, to add, please. Thank you so much, Iman. Do you have anything to add, Joanna? Only that I think that um, one of the things that we've seen and I think that we've learned is that, you know, like I said, we came thinking we would do site management and we've come away actually deciding that the community can can manage their sites. And I think it's just shown that actually the capacity of the community, if we're going to be like, yes, we need to give some capacity building and we need to give them some tools and we need to help them to engage with the humanitarian community. But but when that has happened, mm. then the community themselves are really are able to manage their their site in a probably more effective and faster way than than we can as as agencies. Well said. This should be the the motto of the community engagement forum. Um. So I forgot to say that if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can um, uh, write it in the chat and. Um, just before moving on to um, to Gil, uh, Jackson has a question Jackson, here for yeah. um, for um, Eman and and Joanna. Do you want to unmute yourself, Jackson? You're asking me, Catherine. I got my question on the chat, and I mean, my question is about the acceptance of the community. It's really hard time, stressful. And sometimes the community will not listen for an outsider to come tell them we need to do this and manage this that way. What level of acceptance and what challenge you guys face? Thank you. And um, Iman or Joanna, do you want to answer that? I think Iman, you should go ahead with this one if you if you can. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, you mean you ask about the challenges for forming the committee? Yeah, because I am um, your uh, I pray your voice break because of the internet. You mean, yeah, sorry, the acceptance of the community, um, forming, yeah. the com yeah. forming and coming from outside to say we need to manage this site one, two, three. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's um, as I mentioned in my uh, introduction about uh, our uh, intervention. Uh, there is like uh, the people here or the IDBs or the sites. They are uh, feel like they are in a big need, an urgent need because those sites suffering from everything. Even everything you can imagine, it's like suffering from uh, lack of everything, basic needs uh, not existing. So when we are as a um, uh, as a, uh, an NRC or international uh, organization, they try to listen to us. They want to benefit as much as they can so they can benefit their uh, IDB. So there is some of acceptance. Uh, from our intervention and maybe the most challenge that they ask, they have their um, raise their expectation. They ask about what you could uh, support this site, how you can benefit those IDBs. So it's like to re their expectation is very high because they want everything and they expect many things from our side. So this is the main challenge and we can manage it by, or we managed it by informing that well, what our capacity as an RC and what we can support them, how we can support them and how we can refer them to other actors who can support. So um, maybe also uh, the we have like an entry point in Rafah when we are intervening in Rafah, for example, uh, uh, sites which we start our intervention by uh, do distribution for urgent needs, what like uh, shelter materials and FI hygiene kits. So they uh, they the, this is like an entry point to our intervention. So uh, you cover some of their needs so you can do your best to continue your intervention. And in Deir al-Balah, so uh, our, our warehouse is empty. There is no nothing allowed to come to our warehouses. So we try to do our best also. So we support them with drinking water, which is an urgent need. So they found like we are in our interventions that we can, we can support them by something. Uh, they are in need, so you trust you as an organization. So uh, you can manage their expectation by explaining exactly what uh, you will do and what will you support them. Also, uh, we found like some of them, uh, like some person who has like 
find himself like site manager and he has nothing to do for the IDBs and how to manage the site. So we try to uh, to conduct like a meeting with them uh, to explain their rules exactly, what they can do, how we can help, how the committee will support him, how the, those maybe when you have like uh, many persons in the same committee so they can complete each other, they can cover the main gaps, they can uh, refer their need to uh, other humanitarian actors. So, um, um, so this is the main issues that we face. And 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 I mentioned something also related to the uh, to the to the continuous movement. So, for example, some also sites it's like relocated from this place to this place, and the committee changes, and we we need to start from the beginning. So there is many challenge in our context. Uh, to to reach to have like site management committee in, in the site, it's a very uh, it's like um, a, a magic because nothing nothing easily happened because of many challenges in our context. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, amazing work, Iman, um, and thanks for um, answering that question. Um, Yusuf, you raised your hand as well. I just want to refer to the first question about the community acceptance. Okay, acceptance. Already we lost it in day one. The yeah, humanitarians failed entirely, have failed and lost its community acceptance from in, within the Gaza community since day one because we weren't able to provide or to do our role that we're supposed to be doing. Oh, yeah. New contingency planning, oh. shelters, and all of that was just simply have been destroyed in one minute. And on the other hand, when we, I just want to refer to Joanna, and so repeat with me, Joanna, I covered this war as a journalist and as advocacy officer for Nancy and the key staff for Nancy from October 7th to mid-April. So I was managing all of these, so I, I had to do site management, I had to do logistic, I had to be advisor sometimes, just a bit of everything. It's not that we can't, again, a man said that having a site management and and it's going to be magic and you will never have it. When you have the entire population is in a constant move and 80% of the population under evacuation order, it's impossible to manage and to keep site management in place at least as an issue. Sorry, Yusuf, you're breaking up a little bit. Is no there anything you can do yes, about your um, um, connection? Maybe. Maybe turning off your camera. It works now. We can. Yeah, we can hear you. If you can just repeat uh, your last point. Um. So I will. I'll get back for again. We. No, it's still broken up. No, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Oh, hear you. Yes. You hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Now it's better. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So it's from the airport. Sorry. Okay. So basically, again, I go back for the community acceptance. We lost it without any questions since day one because all these contingency planning and preparedness, even under the EU DOC and CCM, have failed since day one because the Israeli army haven't allowed the humanitarian actors to do their role. So this is something we already lost it, and I don't think we can have it again. And we we were seeing that when with this looting and attacks was mainly new unidentified drugs and all of that. Basically, because we. We lost the community access and it was mainly, uh, this is according to me when I was in start, this up to mid-April, when I left Gaza, Yusuf, you're breaking up again. We caught your first point on the trust being um, uh, completely gone. Um, now we can't hear you. Would you be able to maybe, I don't know, log off and log on again or write in the chat so we don't miss your point? 
Me. No, sorry, Yusuf. Back. Okay, yes, try and log off and on again. Um, sorry about this. Um, you know, technical glitches, they happen. Um, he will try and join us again. Um, um, in the meantime, I want to hand over to Gil, if you are here, I can see you here, um, who has been focusing more on the on complacent feedback mechanism um, and you know, the aspect of um, uh, using different platforms for meaningful feedback from the displaced and um, how that can um, hopefully influence and change programming. Um, Gil, are you there? You want to explain uh, uh, a little bit about how you've been able to do this? Hi. Yeah, can you hear me uh, loud and clear? I just, I'm loud just checking clear. because how, a while ago, I think my line is also breaking. Um, probably personally, I just wanna say um, congratulations to Juan and team, you know, it's really well done, you know, uh, for you to really do a lot of community engagement at this point. Um, probably I just go back again to the issue about uh, the trust, because as you may know, I think I have to start this because if you look at the overall trust, um, not only with the UN, but with the all, overall humanitarian community, you're right, it's alarmingly low. I mean, over the last months of conducting community um, consultations in, 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 in various sites in the OPT, clearly there is a rise in this anti kind of UN or humanitarian community rhetoric. And in a way, this, this also undermines, you know, not only the capacity, but of course, um, as much as we wanted to really push all this, you know, you know, the humanitarian principles, you know, for us to work, I think it goes back as to the, the the most important thing about how we work in solidarity with the affected people or at risk community. So it, it all boils down to that at this point, because as mentioned, I think is that the situation of people on the move worsens while at the same time our work becomes harder or challenging. I'm speaking this not only about those people who have access to to go to Gaza, but more importantly here is the fact that most of the agencies uh, doing community engagement or AP work, I mean, over the last decade, somehow have invested on establishing different structures and different um, relationships and different kind of links in the area. And then suddenly it collapses where to the point where there's a trust issue, but at the same time, uh, it's like back to square one. You know what I mean? Like you're trying again to to look for those people who've been part of this structure, like a community structure, but at the same time, trying to ensure that you find the ways to look for those people who have been trained, capacitated, who've been part of the program, etc. So this is the kind of dilemma. And I think Omar here, uh, my colleague from UNICEF, who's also supporting UNICEF, could also add to what I'm going to say. Um, I think the the strong collective solidarity is one of the things we're pushing, apart from you know setting up this interagency uh, mechanism. I mean, a lot has been done over the ten over the last ten months, but I think we are in a point where even if we try to set up something and have a strong capacity resources to that, it also boils down if people will trust that. I mean, it, 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 it's a kind of challenge now where the dilemma where we wanted to ensure that this level of, you know, um, of, of, of dialogue with the people goes back again to doing small things. So for instance, some of my colleagues have been doing a lot of community engagement, uh, community consultations over the last 10 months. Basically, the people are more interested to basically just to listen more than just, you know, for them to to showcase or to provide any kind of aid support or aid intervention. And under these circumstances, you can see that people to people sharing of information and then resources have become really the backbone of the people. And this is also a challenge for us. I mean, for some of the agencies, because despite the fact setting up something which I'm going later on, we we continue to struggle about having these available channels versus you know the preferred or trusted ones. So, like for instance, we have the hotline. Basically, people are investing about supporting this, you know, um, humanitarian radio programming. People are also looking into supporting one of those preferred channels of the people, which is the social media engagement. And then, of course, more uh, people to people um, inter uh, interface kind of dialogue. But the challenge here is that, of course, as mentioned, 
there's always uh, it remains complex of course the situation and the solution may not be immediate and then at the same time we're looking into how do we build trust to people over time and this is i think the the kind of challenge as well because we found out again that the lack of proper consultations to know what people preferred over time also contributed to people basically, you know, not trusting those channels. Um, sorry, I saw Yosef's hand. Um, I'm yeah, not sure if yeah, she's asking, you asking the question. Yeah, just well, to refer this, uh, we are. I think we have the same opinion to what, what's going on, but to have a proper community acceptance and even site management in a right way, we have to build that trust which is already have been lost and will never be recovered and unfortunately the entire population now in this constant move and this under the site management issue it's not that the ideal scenario and please be with me joanna is that, that we build the capacity with the site management and focal points that was a mechanism that have been invented and put in place because no one will dare to represent and step ahead and say Yes, let's do an institution. It's institutional site management because there is no government. Honor was barely providing for people who are, you know, Honor was the only functioning system we had up to I was in Rafa, so we had to rely on only on Honorwa capacity. Even us as an RC and the majority of other humanitarian actors lost all of their resources after 12 October when they have been evacuated from north to south. When the humanitarian for all these rules that have been put in place by the Israelis, we failed to have the, 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 there. We, 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 we lost our community acceptance and it's impossible. We will build it again. And if we relay on building, I, it's a really good mechanism that Iman and Joanna, because I've been part of that when I was in, in, in Rafah and we were building the capacity with focal points and different sites. We had at that time 13 sites. But after the evacuation orders and destruction that happened in Rafah, we end up having that cycle of con constant movement and evacuation order. So whatever you build, it will be destroyed in a few days. People, as people building their tents and makeshift shelters, and they have to be in constant move. Also, as humanitarian actors, they have to keep be following to adapt and provide needs. But unfortunately, it never happened that any of the NGOs, any of the humanitarian actors have fulfilled any of the need, even of all of us, because there is a lack of coordination. There is lack of resources, of course, because everything is censorship, everything had to, it's very complicated to process even to have the aid in the NFI, especially with NRC, because we work in shelter. So I, I've been, this is the conversation behind and in the offices between COGAT and CLA and item by item, why is that? And the postponing for all these details, the will use list. People on the ground will never understand it. They see us who failed a humanitarian system, an entire system that have been invested in since years just collapse in one day. So community acceptance and this trust, that's something already, that's it. We'll never have it. And to be able to have a proper community engagement, we need institutional governments in place. We need someone to represent these sides and say, and even from political perspective, unfortunately, even as a humanitarian, we have to be white, uh, we, white we need to wipe our hands from politics. But the situation on the ground is pushing us there. I, I worked with NRC since 21 until last month as an advocacy officer. Our role is we're humanitarian. I'm a journalist. I joined the field of humanitarians to be away from all that mess. And I found myself more and more in depth in politics because it's all about politics in that context. It's as simple as that. And also, again, there is your we do, even as a humanitarian actors we, until now which is 10 months i don't know how on earth we didn't have the institutional body to, to to provide and support on the ground it's just these efforts from nrc unicef and other it's, it became when you scatter these efforts you never fulfill a need because we know that we are lacking at we are in the best case scenario we reach 10 percent of what we need in the best case scenario. There is an issue with the humanitarian system, and there is an issue with the Israelis evacuation order when you're talking about 80% under the evacuation order, so it's impossible. And again, the focus, the old focus when it goes for, from an area to another area, and this constant moves again, it makes it really impossible. When you, when, when you mention it, it's magic. It is magic. 
Yeah, for example, they have four sites in, in their Bala. Now the Israelis will have kind of uh, reduced some attention for two days for the vaccination. And then after a few days, trust me, these four sites will, they will, will never be there. How to cope with that? It's impossible. Without an institutional overview and representative for this site management and the humanitarian role on the ground, it's impossible. And no one, no NGO will dare to present a step ahead and said, yes, I will be, I will do the site management. I'll be in charge of that. I remember when I was in Gaza, it was a huge negotiations between ACTED, UNRWA, NRC, different actors. And I remember UNRWA and someone just decided to keep it on, but it seems not working. Yes, Joanna. Okay, um, I think Joanna, before I, I Jim, give that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Go before on. I, yeah. Thank you so much, Yosef. I think I just continue to what Yosef said, emphasize about, and this is exactly the point why even at the interagency level right now, we're trying to have some recalibrated approach, even the setting up of this available channels and preferred channels. So uh, the, the, the point taken here is the fact that probably because of not only you have the resource or capacities to, you know, to, to maintain, to sustain, and at the same time to, to manage all these interagency channels, like uh, how WFP, UN Women, UN OCHA, and UNICEF, and other agencies work, work together on a particular hotline or helpline. And at the same time, integrating it with the other channel, like the humanitarian radio programming, which is also one of the preferred channels of the people, plus ensuring that there is some, uh, definitely the issue here is also not only the collapse of the community structure, but we're talking about here also the infrastructure on communication, which also affected, you know, the day to day kind of, you know, access of people to some reliable information. And it does not stop us really, you know, to find a way to really support what people prefer, because it's really like managing expectation right now where as people preferred more of this face to face kind of engagement. is always at a security and at risk issue, considering that people are on the move plus. This is not a situation like now. I mean, some people here might be also deployed uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan, Myanmar, even in Bangladesh, where at this point, there's clearly now the kind of, of you know, a kind of, of space where in Afghanistan, you can do community engagement, you can set up community engagement centers, but at the same time, you see Taliban observing what you're doing and understanding that, yes, this is a non-negotiable component for us. Now you're seeing what we're doing in the same way with Myanmar, where you get the opportunity to really engage with the de facto authority plus the other side, the other party, just to make them understand why we're doing this and why is it that we need to engage the community in the best way possible according to the preferred or trusted channel. Same thing with Bangladesh. We're seeing right now at, in Gaza is basically, as mentioned to you before, the importance of the solidarity. Solidarity not only because we we understand, um, you know, you know what has was happening to them, but also to, for them to see that also we are as humanitarian, we're also affected. We can also do our work um, in a more, or I say to do more, but at the same time, to 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 ensure that we we sustain that kind of support for them. So, for instance, right now, um, one of the things as well we're trying to, uh, to do is that the recalibrated approach is more than just setting up something. Again, it all goes back as well that how people will trust this in the same manner that we need people to understand that they need also to, to trust the overall aid system or community system. You know, this institutional arrangement with all the dynamics of those and other processes needs as well to be communicated or articulated at some point. So this is the, the kind of dilemma or challenge where you want to support more community engagement, but at the same time, you're trying to achieve it in a more small way rather than you know expanding a bit like you know the people you use this you, you people can access that and so forth so for now i think going back to the uh, to the overall engagement is that it's not because we're not doing enough it's not because um, we're trying to um, trying to be more like you know uh, trying to ensure that we we're not contributing to more harm to the people and at the same time ensuring that we are not or we are lessening, if not avoiding, a lot of community consultation fatigue. And I think as mentioned before, mm -hmm. the issue here as well is the way we engage them and also the kind of the way we ask them and the kind of questions, kind of, you know, because more than anything else, uh, as mentioned, people prepare just only for, for someone to listen. And this has been like, you know, the recurring kind of uh, feedback I received from other colleagues where people are just interested for them to see how we listen to them more than, of course, providing them the necessary um, answer or action to what they to you know, to what they need. 
And plus the fact that our out of the solidarity, that you know, for us, basically, we are not, I mean, for, 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 for us humanitarians, basically, we are not only looking for this humanitarian pause. We're not only looking into the safety corridors, you know, or safe zones for us to work. Basically, we would like to support as part of solidarity to have the ceasefire. And we know for a fact that this will not happen anytime soon. The fact that people are on the move constantly, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot of, not only rumors, actually. It's basically like an announcement or, you know, like a public statement that, yeah, we're going to to do another round of, you know, of, of attack, things like that. So right now what we're doing is basically, um, because as mentioned, there's already a system in place before. There's already a structure before but all these things collapses when it comes to you know the 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 the, the impact and the overall um you know um um results of of, of, of this uh um recent attack but it doesn't mean that this system will not work at all the recalibration approach in a way takes time but i think this gives the humanitarian community a more mindful cautious strategy that might work or may not work and this is in terms again of testing what work in other countries or other, other set up where we think we can also be you know um can be adapted and i think this is a work in progress and we continue to you know as mentioned continue to relearn and learn you know what i mean like we we need to ensure that we have that kind of opportunity otherwise we may be a, go back again you know to all this all negative negativity because as part of the thing that we we're we discussing within the humanitarian communities about sending a positive message as well at the same time, all the more that we need to come up with hopeful story, you know what I mean? Like, you know, to, to ensure that we manage to, um, you know, um, to negate some of this, um, you know, misinformation is happening. Uh, that's all for me, I think. Um, so probably there's a question, there are questions. So, uh, so in, in consideration of the time, Kirsten, I think. So, yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, there's a few questions. And Joanna, I know you wanted to answer um, or add something to what Yusuf was saying. There's a couple of questions for you after you've done that as well um, in the chat. Oh, so I, I guess I just wanted to respond a little bit to Yusuf and, and say, of course, like we can all see this situation is incredibly desperate. And, you know, I have been to Gaza. I was there. Probably I just missed you. Um, I came in, in in during May, so I was there for May. And yeah, it's it's awful and it's desperate. And of course, you know, we cannot as a human, we are not being able to as a humanitarian community provide the needs that people provide for people's even very basic needs. Like, you know, we're not talking about fair standards here. We're not talking about providing good living conditions. But but I do, I would say that I do think we still need to, as Gil said, try and look as much as possible on the more positive side that this is what I have seen the population also needing to do to get by every day. And um, it's, things are a little bit different in terms of our site management programming now compared to what we were doing in Rafa. We've come up with this different approach in order to try and see if we can at, at least address that really like most desperate level of need and you know use this approach because it's practical because it because it can work but it's we know it's not going to solve everything and i would just say on the trust side of it that we have been like really ple like pleasantly surprised like iman says it's magic like people are trusting us and i know that i also was when when before the inc the rafa incursion before the displacement i was also hearing from from people in sites from from site administrators from site representatives that they you know they were disappointed that things weren't coming that things were too slow i think that once we saw this movement from rafa to, to an even more desperate situation i think people are just i mean there's so little that if you can help them get anything then you have given some you know there there is some level of trust there and i think that the work of the that the team has been doing that that like the team on the ground is really being conscious of trying to make sure that we are not um, that we're managing expectations, that we're not over promising, that people know, um, you know, what we can and can't can't support them with. And I think that we have managed to build some trust back. I mean, of course, it's not the level of trust that people, you know, we're going to be able to come and solve everything. But I hope that now we have been able to build a little bit of trust. This is what I'm hearing from the team, and you know, people are engaging in the committees. So yeah, I I hope you'll get a chance to see it maybe sometime, Yusuf. 
Inshallah. Okay. Um, before you before you mute yourself, um, there was a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one from Shadab is congratulating your work. Um, but he's asking, considering the regular movement and communication blackout observed, how do you stay connected with the site focal points? And in addition, I'm assuming you cannot physically access these sites every day. So practically, how do you stay in touch with them? So yeah, I mean there is a there is a communication challenges. Obviously, generally we've still seen the ability to use like cellular phone network. So like even if there's no internet, we can make phone calls. Um, so when, for example, the the Lafayette incursion happened and there was the large scale displacement, we spent lots and lots of time phoning people on the phone, finding out where have they gone, um, what's what's been happening with them, where are they now, how is the situation on the site. So we can use phone calls. Um, we can do regular site visits within only those sites within the accessible area. Um, and then we are trying at the moment, still trying to at least get some contact with, with other sites outside of that accessible area, but again, through phone calls. So we're relying a lot on, on this. There is some internet access and we're looking to try and see if we can put in place uh, some kind of um, communication with these focal points, like a system with, for example, WhatsApp groups or a way that the, the focal points can communicate with each other to share their experience and maybe um, get some ideas about things that have worked in their sites and, and share between them. I hope that answers the question. I mean, it is challenging, obviously. Thank you. I think a lot of people have been wondering about this. Um, as we know, there's so many blackouts and, and um, communication issues um, in Gaza. Um, and there's another question as well for you um, and Iman from Lubna about how you're coordinating with others, um, both the needs that you're identifying and you know, whether others are doing similar initiatives. Um, yeah. So I would say that, yeah, this is this, this is a, a huge challenge, actually. Like the challenge is mainly because of the lack of services. So obviously we wanted to build like a referral mechanism really strongly into our response so that, you know, we would go to these sites, we would be able to establish committees or even if committees existed that we just focus on referring out to service, like for, to other clusters, to major agencies. Um, but it's been challenging because of the lack of services that exist, not because no, not because of the lack of will, but because of the lack of means. But we are still trying to work on this wherever we can, whenever we know about services existing, we will do our best to try and draw them in, try and give people information about where they can access things, you know, in the surrounding area. And we're hoping, I actually see that Daniel is on the line, but we're actually hoping to get this site manager into Gaza, the um, IOM, information management system that automates referrals yeah. and so we're hoping that then with this it will help us to be able to just focus those really limited number of resources into the you know into the where the needs are the greatest because it's been one of the challenges in the response and we're hoping that the work we're doing can try and at least inform this a little bit over yeah and we should mention that there is also a site management working group um Right for Gaza, is it called Site Management Working Group? Um, yeah, I think yes, yes, yes. Maddie is here, who was uh, co-chairing it for Acted for a while, and um, and um, is it the new co-chairs for Acted? Is uh, so I'm looking through the the participant list as I'm speaking. Is it Rahul, or am I remembering the wrong name? I don't know if he is here. Um, he's unfortunately traveling into Gaza today, so I don't think he is able to join. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I also just want to add one really small thing in the kind of couple of minutes that we have left on community engagement in the also to sort of shout out and big up the role of the a lot of the national NGOs, um, like the the work that they have been doing, they haven't necessarily been calling it CCCM or been calling it site management, but they have been doing a lot of like community engagement and a lot of information management and trying to get at, get also try and bring services to the populations 
in different ways. So I think it's also a really um, interesting uh, case study. The Gaza context is a really interesting case study of kind of really innovative and just different ways of trying to do this community engagement born out of necessity. And obviously NRC's model has been um, one way of doing this. The different national NGOs um, who are already having a lot of these relationships with uh, the community is another um, like a kind of different approach. And I think all of it together is hopefully creating a stronger response overall. Over. Thanks, Maddy, for adding that. And um, just to mention as well, we tried to reach out to a lot of the national NGOs in Gaza um, to join us today and provide their examples, um, being very aware that they've been doing work in Gaza for years um, um, during different um, um, attacks over the years um, and are still doing a lot uh, when it comes to engaging the community and ensuring that their part of um, the response, um, including the Red Crescent, of course, um, but they weren't able to join today for different reasons. Um, Fernanda, you had your hand up. Um, sorry to, I didn't ignore you. There was just a lot of questions to go through. No worries. Uh, this is a question to Gil. Gil, are you still there? Yes. yes okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> I said to it. Okay, so it's your talk. What's the point of a community feedback mechanism interagency one when we read the sit reps from uh, mm -hmm. the existing ones like UNICEF? They have sit reps on what's this, yeah. what's what's being said, what's being asked by the existing mechanisms. And according to what I read in some of the sit reps, communities yeah. are asking for service which cannot be delivered because of access and other constraints. Mm -hmm. And communities are asking also, please stop the bombs. So mm -hmm. why are we investing so much money and resources on a mm -hmm. CFM interagency to probably most likely hear the same questions and comments? Thank you. Yeah, Th thanks for the question. I think I, I really love that question because I think uh, this is really the kind of reality check, you know what I mean? So for, as mentioned before, one reason we are taking a step back and at the same time recalibrating our approach is because we're looking into how to make sure all those identified channels, I mean, the available and then at the same time, the preferred channels would really work. And how do we ensure that we're not only talking about, you know, the immediate, we're talking as well, considering the protracted and prolonged displacement. How do we sustain that in the coming months? So we're talking about, you know, setting up something. Uh, actually, there's already one so already set up, like the, the joint hotline between WFP and UNICEF, and there are other agencies that would like as well to use that. Plus the additional um, kind of solution we're providing in terms of integrating that to the humanitarian regime programming, for instance, because there are independent, you know, humanitarian journalists who also wanted to ensure that they are setting it up not in other area but in Gaza. But as mentioned, the question here is about identifying the safe zone for them, and that is exactly the point as well. At part of this positioning of the interagency is also to be part of the kind of negotiation you know, negotiation um, discussion about how do we ensure that all this are integrated and become a more um, standing agenda in whatever high level discussion to ensure that in any point of ceasefire, for instance, or any point of ensuring the safe zone, all these are being set up, being protected and be can run and go. So this is the kind of situation right now we're trying to look into more than just trying again, more than just trying to set up based on the existing capacity or resources. Actually, it's more like ensuring that this will work and ensuring that there are many agencies, especially the local NGOs, actually. So we're, we're banking on actually on the local NGOs to support this um, mechanism, plus at the fact that we're also expanding. And I think this is the kind of discussion within the, the interagency level. It's about the discussion about engaging uh, more NGOs to ensure that they are the ones really doing a lot of this, you know, um, face to face kind of engagement. And of course, we're talking into, you know, not only the capacity building or at the same time using the usual jargon about using common service tools, but more importantly, um, what are the practicalities of this and how does it work when it comes to what they see would really work or not? So we're looking at that kind of scenario. So I think as for now, considering the situation, um, this. We are the I think the, the the challenge with the agency right now is to look for a lot of entry points and a lot of of consideration as well about this movement. I mean, 
some people, I mean, some agencies are already raring to set up something like a, a, a more um, stable kind of community engagement centers to ensure that this kind of overall kind of face to face is happening. But it's quite, quite impossible at the moment. Thanks, Fernanda and, and Gail. Um, um, I see that it's um, um, we're going past the hour, um, um, but for those who are still able to stay with us, you, you're very welcome to do that. If um, um, if you have any more comments or questions, um, and um, to Gail and uh, Joanna and Aman and Yusuf is is still with us. I think he might have had to leave. Um, do you have any any final points? Anything you want to share with other humanitarian practitioners or agencies? Um, any tips? Any any learnings? Or have you said it all? Did someone turn on their microphone? Uh, yes, that was me. Um, Shabir, how are you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I, I mean, I just been to. I, I was there uh, in Gaza, and then we did a training, and then also I did the community meetings uh, because, as Joanna said, and speaking with the other, other, other. Uh, CCCM asset management people is there is a huge need on 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 the capacity building for the communities because in reality they are the one uh, who are actually running the camps or going to not camps the sites sorry I keep uh, making the mistakes and um, so I what I felt like is like there's a huge need um, to to do capacity building of the community committees in a way that would look more practical um yes we can talk about concepts but at the same time it would be very important to give them enough tools on their hand uh, so that they can actually be able to um, coordinate and operate uh, in, in, a, in a much smaller way so we uh, we already work on a training package for the site management actors based on what I uh, did the delivery of the training Maddie um, everybody kind of helped me a lot uh, but at the same time then I felt like uh, yes it's it's very important for the site management actors but at the same time there are thousands of sites and then uh, committees uh, are will be formed are already formed on their own we as the site management actors uh, yes we can we can we can assess the existing structure, or we can support or suggest uh, what could be done better. But at the same time, they we, they would also expect uh, some realistic tools from us. So I think perhaps something we can all work on, uh, something more practical. We can take our time, and uh, that's the thinking uh, kind of kind of thinking coming up in my in my mind, and also in the meeting that I did, uh, communities were telling us that they should have an emergency committee uh, so that they can actually, they're actually referring to the evacuation orders, um, which seems like very critical. And, and even I myself um, experienced it in a week. Uh, I think I had like four or five evacuation orders. I myself got moved from one place to another place. So it's very, very intense um, currently including the site management actors are facing the same problem. There are also ethical dilemmas, um, right? Like when I, as an NGO, somehow I come to know about a about evacuation order that could happen, but at the same time, I, if I go and tell the people, then they will look at me in a different way, seeing me as being connected with the, with the forces. So, so there are a lot of lot of interesting facts actually came up uh, from the so the training that I did I actually used it as a learning opportunity to understand more. Uh, so I was doing I was doing more questions to them, um, actually learning from them, um, and then also the separate committee meetings that I did. So many interesting facts uh, came up. 
um, I'm, I'm not saying I have answers, but uh, I think perhaps we need to rethink. Um, but I absolutely agree. We need to invest um, our time and energy on, on, on capacity building of the community communities for the long run and short term too. Over. Thanks, Shabir. Um, um, it's great to hear from um, from what you were able to do while you were in there, and um, that you were able to to speak to people. Um, I'm wondering when it comes to the issue around the eviction notice um, and um, uh, the trust issue that we were talking about before. If you have any. Um, like we were talking about it yourself and me about whether um, this the dilemma of um, um, information sharing around eviction notices versus not sharing. Do you have any immediate thoughts on on which I, way to I, go? I, to be honest, I didn't uh, because it's both right and wrong. Because if you go and tell people that there's a possibility of evacuation order. Uh, which is not released yet by the forces, and then if it happens, then then there's a there's a possibility of losing, there's a possibility of reputational risk for your organization, and at the same time, should you tell them? Or, so it's a, I, I don't have any answer, but I wanted to put it as a question, maybe as a as, as a thought. Yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts around this? What would be the right thing to do? A very, very difficult question, I think. Might be other uh, people that have been in the same situation. I don't see anyone raising their hand. Um, um, Yaksan, do you um, have any thoughts on this? I mean, there is nothing one thing is the right thing to do. It's everything is the right thing to do. I think the most thing we can do is to keep working, keep going. There's nothing really like as a one thing, and I'm sure everybody knows this, because as everybody mentioned, we cannot deliver what we we we, we, we don't promise, but we cannot deliver what we want to deliver. When we meet with the committee, we lose trust because we cannot deliver. And politically, we have no power. With the advocacy, we even we don't have the power we want. So I think the best way for everybody as a humanitarian or probably as a journalist and, or activist or keep going, that's the only thing. And I think it's the best thing we can do. Thank you. I think um, um, that's some, um, that, that's great uh, parting words. Um, do you want to add anything, Gil? Uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for raising that. But actually, the, we see this uh, gas response really as an opportunity to probably redefine or reshape the way we understand accountability. And again, it goes back to that kind of, you know, um, notion that when you talk about accountability and humanitarians, who are they when it comes to like, you know, how do we engage people like activists? How do we engage more like other actors that could really support us with all this, you know, not only the solidarity, but exactly the agenda that, yes, ceasefire should be, you know, the, the means so that, we as humanitarians can really do our job, you know what I mean? So I think this is the kind of the conversation we're also having. Like, you know, when we talk about accountability, it goes beyond the whole framework of, you know, accountable, all this feedback, participation, et cetera. It also goes to the conversation about, yeah, when you talk about solidarity with people, how do we, what, what does it mean when we continue to have this kind of standing agenda as regards really, you know, stop it and then we support you and, and this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think this is a work in progress, but of course, that this means that another opportunity for us to really disrupt the system. You know what I mean? When I say disrupt the system, it's not exactly to change the system, but to find a way, yeah, as mentioned, you know, to find always the means to do it without really basically sucked up by the system that either derail us or further push us back to do what we can do when it comes to this, you know, uh, you know, the kind of this work. And I think, as mentioned, and I think I'm really glad that even for the World Humanitarian Day to the celebration, it changes the whole narrative about we need to hold those power. When I say power, you know, when it's not only us organization, we're talking about those who are really as the, the power to stop the war. 
to really hold accountable. And I think that in a way, this gives us kind of redefining, you know, the, the or what constitutes me basically about being accountable to affected people. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. We need, um, we need um, a ceasefire and we need to open the borders for assistance and we need more community engagement. That's, yeah. And a free Palestine. Um, so with that, um, unless anyone has any more questions or comments, um, um, we'll close it here. Um, yes, Fernanda, do you want to say something? Yes, we need to defend war. That's what we need. There's no point of agencies uh, transferring funds for humanitarian um, assistance if they don't stop buying um, arms. And we need to defend war. That's how we stop things. Over. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Um, and uh, um, I realize I always forget to ask at the end of every coffee and chat when what I want to ask as well, um, if you have any topic suggestions going forward for these types of um, chats, just you can write to me. You can um, um, uh, you can find me uh, on the CE forum on my email address. Um, uh, you can write to the LinkedIn, to the Instagram. We're everywhere. Um, so thanks everyone. Uh, some of the people that um, joined us today had to leave already, but. Um, thanks Gil and Joanna and um, Yusuf and Iman specifically and to everyone else who, um, who joined into the chat. Thanks so much. Bye everyone. Bye Jan, bye Jan. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.